good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where uh, you're connecting or watching this. It's it's uh, it's my pleasure and my honor, and, and I'm very excited that I'm here with you, Eric, today, because what we are starting today together is a series of interviews, conversations, relaxed chats, however you call them, that hopefully they will shed some light into the magic, the black magic behind what AI is and uh, how it can become a practical solution and technology for uh, digital food safety. Yeah? So this is the series of uh, fireside chats on AI and food safety. I'm Nikos Manuserlis, and with me, I have Eric Westblom, CEO and founder of Provision Analytics. Hi, Eric. Hey, Nikos, great to see you again. Good to see you. What I understand by taking a look at uh, your website and also in the way that you communicate it is that provision analytics is making digital food safety easier. Is that That's so? That's the goal. That is the That's goal. The goal. And this is, this is what is really impressive in my eyes uh, because I see that you're highlighting a lot how we can make technology easier, how we can make technology more usable. Usability is everywhere in uh, in the way that you're communicating the value that you offer. And I think that how we can also make such innovative and difficult solutions like the AI powered ones easy to use is essential. That's right. And, you know, you think about whether it's AI or food safety, software, a lot of this stuff can be complicated. You're, you're collecting a lot of information on a lot of workflows. We want that to be streamlined and configurable so that it is as easy as possible to use for food. Company. So what, what exactly is Provision doing? Give us a little bit of a background. Yeah, that's great. So we started the company in 2018 with the goal of creating a, a flexible software platform to digitize all aspects of food safety, quality, compliance, regulatory, uh, all the, the stacks of paperwork that exist within, within these various facilities in the food supply chain. Uh, we've really ratcheted our focus in recent years to, to fresh produce and that chunk of the supply chain that would be packers, the growers that feed into that, mm -hmm. ultimately wholesale distribution, transport, cold storage, everything that touches that supply chain as we've continue to grow with that, again, an ongoing focus to be flexible. So thinking about the number of different food safety standards that are out there, FSSC, SQF, BRC, Global Gap, Primus, uh, a laundry list of other acronyms. How can we be flexible and accommodating to all of those while making sure that the product is as easy to use as possible? So the product is a software platform. Yes, sir. Software solution that is doing what? So we allow users to capture the data for all of those forms and records mm -hmm. within their food safety program. So this could be anywhere from 50 to 100 to 300 different templates. Think about uh, sanitation, pest control, pre-op inspections, metal detector checks. Uh, water test records, everything that goes into a food safety program. We work with clients to configure all of those forms. Then simultaneously, the unique workflows within a business, and then ultimately the, the reporting and the data insight that can be associated to an audit or them just kind of driving workflow and process of improvement internally. So that's everything that we're, we're doing within our product and then continuing to expand uh, the modular offering from there. Who, who is the typical user of uh, the software, Eric? So who are you expecting to be using the software on a daily or a weekly basis? It's interesting. We've seen that grow over time. So what is, you know, anybody on a, a production line or a packing line, growers, quality assurance managers, some exposures to QC, uh, all the way up to supervisors. And then that started expand, expanding out into, you know, what I was talking about is uh, sanitation staff, 
pest control staff, facilities staff. And now we're we're seeing even some pickup and translation over to pure play health and safety, right? right. Making sure that the operations are on health, health and safety within these facilities have all of the, the data captured that they need. So that's maybe the organic growth of the product within some of these companies that we work with. Mm -hmm. And then starting now to build it up towards elements of supplier management, vendor management, where you've got procurement involved and gradually reaching into these different areas of the businesses. Which means different people as well within the organization, huh? going from a production line level to the level of uh, headquarters or the, the corporate part of uh, a company. That's right. And, you know, that would speak to both our small clients and then some of our larger ones is ultimately some of that supervisory or even C-suite level is starting to look mm -hmm. at this where there's not only efficiency to be gained or considered, but market access and then liability, depending how you're looking at food safety as a uh, kind of a, a cost center or a, or a liability, a risk center within the business, mm -hmm. or is it a differentiator in terms of market access and how does it help you maintain relationships with some of your biggest buyers? Mm. And where does AI come to play? Yeah, where does AI come to play in the world? Um, I think we're still at the the bottom of that inflection point in the the industry as a whole. Uh, knowing a more pragmatic general user tool that's come out like ChatGPT, we use that internally at our business all the time. How does really? that? Ex yeah, it's interesting, right? And so our look at it is how do you extrapolate something like ChatGPT or these large language models, and how can you start applying it to? our product or to food safety at a macro level or, or whatever that means. And then you could start looking at the perceivably more complicated things after that. Can you give me a scenario, a use case where you see such a solution like a large language model being useful and relevant for one of your users? Yeah. I what we're starting to poke around with uh, a little bit internally is if you were to apply one of these large language models to a food safety program, how much efficiency can be gained? Because where food safety capture a, a lot of data in a lot of different instances of paperwork, right? So you fill out a sanitation record on a daily basis, or you fill out a packing, cooling, storage, harvest records, whatever these are at the farm level, at the packing level. If you're filling out this paperwork, you have a lot of instances of that data captured on repeat. Today, our, our software does a tremendous job in speeding up the audit preparation component. So instead of taking a whole bunch of binders or paper or spreadsheets and organizing them in preparation for an audit, our software can compress all of that into customized tabular reports to pull out what you need when you need it. So now let's fast forward to AI and we're poking around is, could you just dynamically ask an LLM for the information you want on the spot, right? Can that be streamlined and, and sped up? I think so, but uh, there's the combination of, is it pulling what you need and then what does user adoption look like? And I think that's gonna be trailing the rest of AI adoption in humanity. So what I hear you saying is that we have lots of data that we are collecting and we are trying to organize coming on different formats, but also at different time instances, points in time and different workflows. And we already do a great job, you're saying, in facilitating and making easier the way that people interact and discover the information that they need within all this data. But what we would like to explore is whether we can do it in a more natural way. This kind right. of interaction with a system that will provide or will extract the information from all the data. Give me an example of a question that I can ask to provision analytics, uh, chat GPT, so that I, get, I can get such an answer. I, I, th I think a great example of this would be you know, hay provision or whatever that equivalent example is, um, ex 
prepare my audit, give me all of the paperwork for the last year associated to uh, packing, cooling, and storage for FISMA 204. Pull all the key data elements for FISMA 204 associated to this product. And again, rather than going and configuring these tabular reports, you could pull dynamic information just right out of your database real time in any formatted layout that you want. So whether it's the FDA demanding it or some of your biggest customers, you can shape it into bullets. You could put it into a, a long form readout, right? It's the dynamic nature that you can pull and organize that data very quickly. So what you're describing here, if I get it right, I will try to translate it in uh, simple components in, in my mind. Is first of all that the question per se hides the complexity of the requirements of the final format of this report. So I don't have to define it by using some kind of screen or uh, yeah. selections or, or whatever. I just spill out my request and then the machine, the model, translates this into fixed requirements that it does know that this uh needs. Yeah, second, yeah. That, so yeah, that's one ahead. part. Then the second part, if I get it right, is getting from all the data that I have in my storage, in my databases, the right pieces of information that come and meet those requirements. Second, and then preparing practically the actual report uh, in a format that is uh, required and acceptable by the inspection uh, authority. Do I get this right? Is this what you have in mind? Yep, you're absolutely correct. And if you, you know, if you consider some of the largest buyers in the food supply chain today, think about the biggest retailers, these large retail chains or even the large restaurant consortiums, uh, we're starting to see them creating addendums or their adjustments to core food safety standards like SQF, BRC, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Well, what you used to be able to produce for an audit preparation report for one standard now has a whole bunch of different variations that are potentially coming down, uh, you know, currently or in the future. So rather than configuring a whole bunch of reports and trying to monitor all these different standards, I think there's probably an opportunity to just train models on what the expectation is and then just call on the information you need for uh, that entity that's looking at you or the use case that you're trying to pull that's being organized for you dynamically instead of having to hand craft and hand tune these things over time. That's interesting. So what I hear you describing is that if I find a way to train, configure my AI model uh, to do this, mappings and transformations in the different versions of the same information of this of the similar reports internally they can then i can use it so that they can generate them again and again and again depending on the request eh? yeah okay so i have a i have a difficult question for you here because at least this is something that i hear from uh from people that uh, we talked at the market eh? To do something like this, this kind of configuration, uh, I would expect, I assume that you do it together with one of your customers. So you sit together next to a customer, they tell you about the typical requests that they get, and then you try to prepare the model that will serve such a, a scenario. But then what you're saying is that I will take this that I have co-developed with my client and go and reuse it for another customer who might be also their competitor. How does it sound? Is this a blocker? Is this an opportunity? What do you think? Well, I think first and foremost, in our case, our clients own their data. So any applicability of the type of thing that we're talking about would be generic and applied to their data sets. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, there would be a goal to aggregate and anonymize information to provide some other value-added outputs like industry benchmarking or something like that. 
Uh, naturally, what comes with that is the data governance, accessibility, um, obviously ensuring anonymity. Uh, there's some considerations there that, frankly, we have, we haven't dove into yet. We don't know how to to slice and dice that today. It's all part and parcel of what provision analytics and any other company out there in any other industry is going to have to figure out is what does that look like? Because like first, first and foremost to us, the, the customers own their data. The last thing that I, you know, that provision wants to do is make a client uncomfortable where historically some software companies 10, 20 years ago, or maybe even more recently have made the mistake of trying to own data. I think that's challenging. Um, but there, there's naturally going to be a bunch of challenges around data governance and what you display and how and where you're building these things. Those LLMs in that example are probably going to have to be isolated to individual client data instances, if that makes sense. That, that's a very interesting uh, argument that you're making, or maybe I hear two of them. Let's see if I, I get them right. And I'm I'm taking it slow so that people that watch us can understand uh, the complexities that you're describing, because what you're describing is quite complex. Eh? First of all, you're saying, I will try to train a generic model. So it's not something that will be based and working only if it has the data of my client. Correct. First of all, and second, this means that I, I don't take the data of my client away. I am only using the use case there, the opportunity to train a model that will serve and add value to their data. Which means that if I can take then the model and apply it in a different case, nothing will happen to the data of my customer. Which is, I think, an excellent argument. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, uh, that's a, an initial thesis on the idea. And I think we build from there and the industry is going to have to learn from each other. Right. But you also have, you're also describing a second scenario that is also interesting. Yeah. I, I find it very interesting that I can also develop and train a model for a particular client because the data that has been used and the model that we have developed and trained for them, they fit to their data and they fit to the solution that I'm offering there. So in scenario A, you would be trying to develop something that is quite generic with clear disconnection from the data so that it can be applied to other yep. cases. In scenario B, you're looking for a solution that can be customized, configured, and deployed on a client per client basis. Huh? Where yeah, where I... do you think where do you see more value or where does your heart come closer to? I don't know where I see more value, to be honest with you. I think each have their own highlights. You know, maybe one of the tools that I use on a daily basis, uh, we use Notion for all in internal documentation. Well, Notion's got a beautiful, simple, easy to use AI to just summarize whatever you need based out of your whole company's documentation. That saves tens of hours of weeks, maybe a hundred hours a week for our team and just summarizing things, preparing everything from internal memos to outbound documentation, emails and the whole work, the whole works. And I think about that as an analogous use case where uh, Notion is locked down to your individual data instance where it can report on your company's information. You can also pull from outside. Uh, there would be some, some analog there to consider when, you know, provision takes it or your company takes it or whatever to, to use these in these types of use cases. And of course, it's like an onion, right? You peel one layer and then you've got another question for me and another question and pretty soon I get run away, right? But I, I really like the fact that what you're describing here as an analogy uh, is something that you're trying and using and that you see value uh, coming out of it. So you say, we do try it and use it in this way, and we get value 
by letting such a model, such a solution and model be trained on our data. Yeah. And we feel comfortable with that and confident that nobody else uh, that is using this technology uh, has access to, to our internal data. And this is very important. Yeah. But you also brought up another interesting uh, scenario, opportunity. What if we have a way to anonymize some of the data that one of our customers has so that we can create larger data sets, aggregate data sets, and have more power uh, in what we get from such AI models. What do you think about that? How close are we to, to doing something like this? I can't predict the future on a time base on, on how close we are. I think naturally you're going to have early adopters and you're going to have a number that will never adopt. Uh, but I, you can only compare it to something as ubiquitous as Google versus DuckDuckGo, right? Like if DuckDuckGo is not tracking any of your data or all of that, you're getting a search engine that works. But Google, I would argue, and I think that a lot of people are on the other side of the curve are use all of my information, listen to me all the time to make my life easier. And there's always going to be those early adopters that I think start to take that sentiment. And as the value props start to derive and the out the outputs of say like aggregate benchmarking for risk in apples, mm -hmm. if you could look at that, well, gradually there that value proposition will grow enough to create adoption. And then more and more people start sharing. I think it's going to take a while uh, because there's going to be a lot of fear and there's going to be a lot of uh, perhaps like relative naivety on how these things work for people to realize that it's a there are a lot of positives that can come out of it and it's not all just Terminator 2. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so what you're saying is that if we find ways to start showing the value of having aggregate larger data sets that do combine private data from, let's say, two parties that agree to, to join their data compared to the value that we get today by having them siloed and protected, then we will have a, we can make a case and we can demonstrate the value and we can get more people on board. Huh? Yeah, so here's the, a very old use case. So obviously far before the advent and commercialization of true AI, uh, I had the opportunity to sit with the Danish Ag and Food Council and their food science, uh, yeah, their data science team in 2018, the same year it founded the company. And they walked me through the, the collaborative effort that the entire poultry supply chain had made within Denmark, where effectively they had eradicated salmonella within their supply chain because it was an open model whereby every hatchery, every pro every kind of grower, processor, everything through the supply chain had to share their data into a massive data lake from my, I don't, I'm on video, so I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but I believe it was the late eighties. And it's, it's a multi-decade aggregation of data in that supply chain so that everyone kind of looked and said, look, if we all just pool our information together, we can all eliminate risk and it's a net positive for everybody. That's a kind of utopian view on some of this stuff where there's going to be competitive information in there, but that gradual adoption over time became this huge output and net benefit for everybody. I'm not necessarily saying that would work in uh, Greece, in your case, I'm not saying that would work in Canada, in our case, or North America. But slowly, this adoption and aggregation of data exposure can provide net benefit, especially to the food supply chain, which is so ubiquitous and so critical to the world, right? What do you think would be obstacles or challenges in doing so? Perceived competitive advantages in landscape. Mm -hmm. I think naturally, whether you're a food company or a bank, you're a metal manufacturer, everybody thinks they have a competitive edge. And in a lot of cases they do, they do something different or unique, but it's all within the same realm. As long as you're not uncovering or giving away 
true unique insight. I think that the ultimate net output of a lot of this stuff, there is a positive to it, as long as you're not giving up proprietary competitive secrets. Do you see a, a cultural differentiation there? Does culture play a role? Do we have countries that are more open in following this road, like Denmark, compared to more traditional yes. ones? Yes, I guess I do. Um, I'm not going to name those countries, but I will tell you that some of them are further north and some of them are further south. Okay. So there are plenty of factors for us to keep in mind. Eh? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what's what's your biggest uh, fear, Eric, in terms of AI in uh, the food supply chain, and as in particular in food risk prevention, eh? digital food safety and food risk prevention? Oh man, that that's a hard question. Um, I think naturally these models aren't perfect, and if they start producing data insight, direction, guidance, that type of thing, they're they're not perfect, right? They're never going to be a hundred percent. So I think there could be some some risk uh, around information that's captured and how people use it. And then naturally, I, I believe inherently that people are lazy. This is the backbone of technology, right? Everybody is constantly trying to innovate and create the next thing to reduce workload. And the more dependent that people become on tools like AI, you kind of stop, let's talk about chat GPT, right? You ask it a question and it pukes out two pages worth of content. People just skip the proofread and mm. there could be a whole bunch of nonsense in there. So I think that in the short term would be one of the bigger risk points. That we rely upon AI uh, too much and we skip the the thinking yeah. and the verification part. Yeah, yeah. The, the real work, right? the real world and this might, might backfire that's what i i sense yeah at the end of the day okay so we had around 20 25 minutes of conversation we talked about different things and aspects related to ai and data and uh, its applicability in food safety if you wanted to highlight one the most important thing that uh, we said this afternoon, what what would you choose? What should our viewers keep in mind and not forget? I think that these tools are coming and they're innovating. It's a tremendous way to augment the efficiency of your business. But for now, at least, it is not a way to replace entire uh, work streams. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mechanism for efficiency, not a replacement. I think that's a big thing. I know... I'll just keep using ChatGPT because it's so ubiquitous. I know so many people that use it. I know some leaders in other businesses that were laying off staff in the first two, three months that it came out. And I was like, wow, you think you could just like immediately start eliminating people? I was like, that's pretty early in the adoption cycle to start eliminating humans. So again, it goes back to like efficiency versus replacement. That's probably the biggest macro takeaway. So we are still early in the adoption cycle. Let us not fire our people yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. But we you, can you and I can keep our jobs for now. Yeah, yeah. We can keep our jobs and make sure that we are more efficient using this technology. Yeah. That's a that's a positive message for our closing. That's right. So, Excellent. Eric, thank you so much. I had Eric Westblom, CEO and founder of Provision Analytics, all the way from Canada, connecting. To me, Nikos Manuselis in Greece. Thank you so much, Eric. Amazing. Thanks, Nikos. Bye-bye.